why have wages in Taiwan stagnated in, in recent decades? Is it, is it more of an issue of market forces or is it a policy issue? There's a mirage of a welfare state, not a real one. So people need to work. And that brings the wage down, down to levels you would not have in countries of the same income per capita. So, so this gap in wealth between the top and bottom 20%, uh, how does that compare to other developed economies? Well, it compares badly. Hello and welcome to Connected. I'm Tomasz Koper, sitting in for Divya Gopalan. If you follow tech or finance news, you might be thinking that the Taiwanese economy is booming. Taiwan's chip giant TSMC and others consistently report profits in tens of billions from semiconductors and electronics, and most recently in the field of artificial intelligence. The COVID pandemic showed the world just how important it is to do business with Taiwan, a key part of global supply chains, especially in high-tech products. Over the last few decades, Taiwan has seen a growth in its gross domestic product, or GDP, that would be the envy of many nations around the world. Even when we take that number and divide it by the country's population, we still see that the average Taiwanese person is over two times better off than they were in the year 2000. The problem, however, is in the word average. Ask a person on a typical Taipei street about cost of living and their bank balance, and what they say may give you serious doubts about those figures. That's why today we will be talking about the Taiwanese economy beyond the success story, those who have benefited from it and those who continue to struggle. And to help us do that, we welcome to the studio Professor Alicia Garcia Herrero, who is, among many other things, the chief economist for Asia Pacific at the investment bank Natixis and an adjunct professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. It's great to have you on the show. Um, now, let me start with this. Um, how does Taiwan's GDP growth over the last decade compare to the region, especially the other three uh, Asian tigers, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Singapore? Well, uh, Taiwan has done quite well compared to many, maybe with the exception of Singapore, but it's richer than South Korea or Japan for that matter. In, in income per capita, but you said it very rightly, this is just an average. And I think what uh, Taiwan can't really compete with is income equality, the income equality that Japan offers to its citizens, meaning um, if you are, you know, in, in I would say 60% of the distribution and below, even 70 probably, you're better off in Japan. You're not better off if you are among the richest, in, in the, maybe in the one, five, 10% percentile of the of the richest part of the, the income distribution but for the rest you're not better off so so there is a lot of income inequality that that in a way mesmerizes that uh, great uh, achievement which for sure is an achievement for Taiwan, which is that income per capita has, has doubled, as you mentioned. Well, we'll get to that uh, later in the program, but, but first let's stay with uh, the overall uh, shape of the economy. Uh, there has been a slowdown recently, but um, the, the general trend in, in the last couple of decades has been uh, going up. Um, and do you think that uh, this trend is sustainable? Um, or do you see any obstacles that might prevent Taiwan from continuing to grow? Its, its economy? So Taiwan has gone through a few phases, I would say, with the entry in WTO, uh, there was a lot of expectation of Taiwan continuing to be, you know, the, the best tiger of all of, all of those tigers you mentioned, uh, because of its export oriented uh, and industrial, basically manufacturing oriented economy. But uh, China took it all in a way uh, since 2001. And that also meant that the increasing wages um, through that period, so basically the, the, uh, the first 20 years in, uh, of this century were very low. And that's where you know we saw a lot of migration, whether to the US or the mainland for that matter, for, for higher wages and more opportunities. So Taiwan was doing st still doing well because it was receiving a lot of income from especially the mainland, so big investment being repatriated, partially repatriated, not always fully repatriated, as you know, but still 
you know, doing well on the on that part of the population that owned the companies in the mainland, but not for the wages because those people weren't employed anymore in in Taiwan. So they had to, you know, they had to be employed in services, um, sometimes low skill services. So so the wages were very low. But then we had this uh, new phase where. Uh, a couple of key companies, TSMC being the most obvious, but there's others, MediaTek, many other, um, which then came up with kind of an increasing wages because this was for a very specific part of the population, yeah, electronic en- electronic engineers, et cetera, et cetera. So there was kind of a, a lift up of some wages, but because the, the sector is so important for Taiwan, clearly uh, boosted the economy growth-wise and export-wise, and also help diversify the economy, which is kind of interesting because a lot of those uh, flows were actually going to the U.S. because the U.S. being such a huge uh, export market for high-end semiconductors. And this has only increased because of the AI revolution. So that, that trend, in a way, has been pushed further by the AI revolution. COVID also helped in that regard because Taiwan, as you said, became more central because the, it, there was an ICT revolution related to work from home practices globally. So, you know, all of that, um, in a way, achieved two things to end. First, bringing Taiwan to a much higher income per capita because of higher growth, but huge concentration in one sector, let's face it. I mean, if that sector, for whatever reason, doesn't work, Taiwan will be faced with huge troubles, economic troubles. Uh, something that I've learned that surprised me in, uh, during research for this episode is that uh, Taiwan's uh, tax revenues, uh, including labor insurance and national health insurance, um, only add up to 19% of uh, GDP, um, uh, which is the lowest in Asia, as it turns out. Why is that? Why is Taiwan uh, structured like this? Uh, okay, so it's a good point. Let me tell you that um, there's always competition to be the lowest on Asia. So China is around 18 uh, overall tax uh, revenue. Um, and it's because there is a race to the bottom in, in taxation in Asia. And the main reason is that taxes are perceived to be uh, lowering competitiveness yeah that that is, is kind of the, like the exchange rate i mean the weaker the better we export more with taxes it's a little bit like that and taiwan is no exception on the contrary as you said it's a very uh, extreme case because a lot of the revenue as mentioned come from investment overseas so plants overseas and and those that capital is very hard to tax so we had some cases of amnesties as you know i think 2020 if i'm not mistaken so where where the government tries to bring the money back and allow repatriation without um uh, taxation uh, that's why again the tax uh, base is so low but let me tell you still uh, even if the tax base is low the fiscal the, the fiscal finances are good in taiwan so, 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 it's still uh, not an extreme case where you cannot run a welfare state. You do have a welfare state in Taiwan, maybe not that of Europe, but certainly good for for uh, Asia. Notwithstanding the very ta- very low tax base, so that's kind of the irony that you don't find in many other Asian economies, where the welfare state is minimal, totally minimal. Well, let, let's talk about one of the issues that we raised just now. Taiwan's low salaries and stagnating wages were key issues in the recent presidential and parliamentary elections. This graph plots the growth in wages in Taiwan against the rate of inflation since the year 2000. The two lines run close to each other, with wages rising slightly faster than the prices in the first half of the time period, and then dipping below in the second. Why have wages in Taiwan stagnated in, in recent decades? Is it, is it more of an issue of market forces or is it a policy issue? Well, well, it's a very interesting question because in a way it's not easy to comprehend. Let me tell you, you have this industry, yeah, semiconductor industry, I mean, booming. Uh, Taiwan exports, I don't know, 80 to 90% of advanced semiconductors to the world. How come uh, that's not pushing up wages? I mean, the, we call this touch disease, we economists. It, it means there's a sector that is highly productive. It increases. It 
mm, increases wages and then that increases every other wage because you know if you go to the hairdresser you are um, uh, an electric engineer in, in 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 taiwan then you pay more to the hairdresser that sector will also see uh, pricing wage and price increases what's missing here is the wage increase for some reason and not because taiwan is uh, labor abundant because we have huge labor shortages so it's 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 unbelievable because you know we, we don't have the people to work at that wage but the interesting thing is people still work at that age at that wage that that's the that's the difference between taiwan and say germany today no labor people don't work for that wage so they they so either you attract labor from the rest of the world or you accept much higher wages. Yeah, I mean, why doesn't it happen in, in Taiwan? To me, there is one reason is that although we do say Taiwan has, you know, like universal health care, uh, pensions, the reality is it's minimal. There is a mirage of a welfare state, not a real one. So people need to work. And that brings the wage down down to levels you would not have in countries of the same income per capita. I would say that we need to be ready to accept that Taiwan still today works in, in a labor market that, that accepts low wages because those are the only wages that are offered and people need to accept them. And this is because it's not a, full, a fully developed welfare state, in my view. So people have no choice but to work at whatever wage they are offered. And that, that is a very particular case uh, for Taiwan that we can't see in countries of that level of advanced industry where, you know, wages should be pushed up much more than in Taiwan. Well, uh, let's talk about one more aspect of the uh, labor market that we've already mentioned, um, because not everyone is benefiting from Taiwan's economic growth in the same way. This graph shows disposable income available to the top and bottom 20% of the population. Those with the highest incomes have enjoyed a moderate but steady increase, while the bottom 20% seems to be no better or worse off today than they were in the early 2000s. However, the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots becomes starker when we look at total wealth instead of regular income. When accounting for accumulated wealth and capital incomes, we can see that in 2021, the top 20% of the population had almost 67 times more accumulated wealth than the bottom 20%. This is a massive rise from under 17 times difference in 1991. So, so this gap in wealth between the top and bottom 20%, uh, how does that compare to other developed economies? Well, it compares badly. That's what I was trying to say before with Japan, uh, even South Korea. So basically, any country in Europe is better in income distribution wise, any country of, in Western Europe, uh, then uh, Japan better, and then South Korea is slightly better. And then, you know, in, in, of course, China is worse, but you need to go to countries with much lower income per capita to see what you see in Taiwan in terms of income distribution. So yes, it is a problem. And I think the, um, the DPP for 10 years has tried I mean, increasing uh, minimum wages and so on. But the point is, to, to make this sustainable, you need uh, more productive uh, sectors. So you, you need to, again, diversify the economy. You need other sectors. Finance is something that, the, that uh, Tsai Wen tried to, to bank on uh, because of Hong Kong demise. So maybe, you know, and, and Taiwan could become a, a financial center. Uh, Taiwan actually has a dollar, as you know, offshore center within. So, so maybe mm, leveraging on that, uh, it has a huge, uh, it could have a huge asset management industry because it has 300% of GDP in assets, you know, many of which are overseas. And then you could have, of course, more digital services, not only uh, production of semiconductors, digital services. So a little bit emulating the U.S. And that's high wages. If you look at the U.S. today, the productivity increases are coming from digital services. So, you know, Taiwan could emulate that because it has the, the, the skills to do that. Taiwan is in a great spot to develop the education industry. Many people want to learn Chinese, but as you can see from the from the data, the 
uh, overseas uh, Chinese uh, students in the mainland have is really plummeting. And they need to go somewhere. So, you know, Taiwan should offer a huge amount of, of uh, pro, um, programs uh, for um, Chinese speaking students or, uh, or, or to be, basically. And then also um, co um, combine that with, uh, in my opinion, a, a, a tertiary education reform where you accept more foreign students. So you basically run, if the, if the aim of Taiwan is to become a bilingual, uh, society, you need to start with education. So you, you need to create bilingual programs. You know, all of this is high productivity, high wage. Well, all of these points will require a lot of political capital. And to that point, I want to bring in another voice. Thomas Sharak, the senior program manager for University of Pennsylvania's Perry World House, told us about the economic challenges facing Taiwan's new president, Lai Qingde. Take a listen. So with Taiwan, like its economy is growing, but what makes up Taiwan's economy? What is the main part of its, like its stock index, its TSMC? So while TSMC's shares are increasing in value, I don't own any stock in TSMC, so my bank account isn't getting better, and I'm assuming the average Taiwanese as well. So when, with Lai now as president, he may not actually have to be tested in the foreign policy sphere. His true tests are going to be domestic. And the expectations from the electorate are housing prices, stagnant wages, a lot of the things that were issues in 2020, they're now issues again in 2024. So I think there's a lot of expectations. I think that the fact that now Lai has to deal with a divided government with the DPP running the presidency and the LY being split He's going to have to compromise, and there will have to be compromise as well from the KMT and TPP on these issues because there's foreign policy fights, but domestic fights actually affect the everyday person. So, Alicia, uh, uh, Thomas mentions the opposition coalition that now holds the majority in, in the parliament, um, and he, he says the economy is growing. So. Uh, how much political will do you think is there really to to tackle the issues faced by the average wager? Well, I think it, mm, Taiwanese politicians should learn the lesson from the from the latest elections in in January, and and the lesson is voters are not happy. Yeah, I mean they they were voting a third party, especially young people, uh, can went just TTP. Uh, just because out of out of options, um, with a very limited program, if if you see what I mean, I mean, why are they voting uh, for this? Because they want some change. So for me, there is uh, there should be uh, at at some point in time, you know, leaving differences uh, as far as China is concerned aside and focus on Taiwan. So what does Taiwan want to be? I mean, I, I as an economist, I've already given you a few ideas and you know i'm sure others will have others um what are the ideas that everybody agrees upon i think there was a lot of agreement in the campaign on uh, affordable housing for example in a way it is a perfect time to say look we join forces and we focus about taiwan's future economic future social future what are the reforms we agree upon i think the economy is probably the easiest because the problems are well identified and i don't think there is so much this consensus about the problems i think that's the one and only way i can see uh, taiwan making that quantum leap towards a more developed in the sense more equal more uh, diversified economy well, uh, we're, we're quickly running out of time, but before we go, I want to ask about one more major issue that came up during the elections, uh, which is real estate prices. Uh, Taipei is now the second most expensive city for real estate uh, in Asia, only behind Hong Kong. Uh, what is driving these prices? Well, uh, I think one issue is that the... Options for investment are limited um, in Taiwan because well, first there's huge savings, excess savings is similar to China, and these excess savings cannot be channeled uh, within the the usual channels because uh, there's just not enough channels. I mean, the, uh, again, their capital controls, the you know, lifers and banks offer uh, uh, financial products, but at the end of the day. Uh, Mm, Taiwan denominated um, 
underlying or investment is, is limited, yeah? Not major infrastructure projects. Not major. So what do you do? You go to the real estate sector. And you, the because interest rates are kept very low, it's, 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 it's easy for, even if, you know, your your rental yield is very low, it will be higher than keeping a deposit in, in NTD. So people just buy because there are no options in, in a way. So, you know, I think there's two things that need to be done here is first, many more what we call macro prudential tools to avoid uh, holding five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten units. So, you know, progressive tax system for those who hold more than one unit. And then uh, the other thing is other options, you know, like maybe mass private equity, mass, I mean, other options for people to invest so that they think twice before they go to the real estate sector. And then, of course, there's a lot of things you need to do on the demand side, um, much more affordable housing. You know, you said Hong Kong. Actually, in terms of affordability, Taiwan is worse because wages are much lower. So probably Taiwan is on the worst if, if you focus on Taipei in Asia in terms of affordability, the worst. So you, you, you see what you need to do. You need to make it more affordable. Uh, and for that, you need government support. And and I don't think uh, the, gov the government more generally is taking this seriously enough. It's a big uh, hindrance for the youth in Taiwan, more than wages, if you ask me, because, you know, it, no matter how much you increase wages, you'll never make it. If affordability is, uh, in, in the housing market is horrible. Yeah. Well, it seems that the, the problems are many, but before we go, let's look at one possible solution. At the moment, Taiwan's economy is heavily dependent on the tech sector. In fact, the chip industry makes up nearly 15% of the country's GDP. But some local governments are looking at ways to generate revenue and create jobs in other fields. Taiwan's third largest city, Kaohsiung, is trying to position itself as an international concert hub, bringing in top musicians like Ed Sheeran and Coldplay, among others. Our contributor, Han Yin Yuan, looks at its impact and whether the benefits are trickling down to local businesses. <laughs> We are from Philippines and we flew here just to watch Ed Sheeran's concert. British singer-songwriter Ed Sheeran performed to a sold-out stadium of 50,000 fans in Kaohsiung in February. He is one of the many high-profile performers that have come through Taiwan in recent years. When I open my eyes, I see a sold-out stadium in Kaohsiung. 2020年直到2022年整體的這個觀光局的調查他們發現 为了要参加这个演唱会，那么他不但要买票，然后呢，他一定要用到交通工具，然后也会在周边呢，哈，走一走，啊，还有呢，如果是远处来的，那可能就会在当地住宿。如果这个演唱会又有设计一些周边的产
那政府要做的是说，如果利用这个巨星来表演的机会，能够让我们 local 地方上的这种文艺音乐会工作者了，能够也是加入，然后慢慢的、慢慢的培养我们自己的人才，让我们的音乐让国外都能够看到。这样子的话，我们才能够把这个民生做出去，创造出更多的经济产值。Concerts of the big-name artists might not be affordable to some of the local residents, but to some of them, it matters little as long as it's good for business. For a full version of that video feature, visit our YouTube channel or the Taiwan Plus website. Um, Alicia, do you think this is the way to go for local governments? Taiwan had an amazing, still has, but I think compared to the past, it's lost a little bit of of its uh, shine to South Korea. But uh, Taiwan had its own industry, you know, movie industry, uh, music industry, and Taiwan is well placed to 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 bring this back. If I were a local uh, government in Kaohsiung or or any any other, I would bank on also on not only attracting uh, you know um, famous people for concerts, but actually. <laughs> reshaping my pop uh, culture or cult, I mean, music culture, uh, cinema culture industry, because that's something that one had. And, and I think it could be extremely interesting uh, as a, you know, in combination with what I said before about developing the service industry. This is a major service industry in some countries. South Korea is a good example of that. So yeah, I, I, I would go for the redeveloping, basically, uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, cultural industry. Thank you very much for all your insights today. Uh, Alicia Garcia Herrero, uh, who is the chief economist for Asia Pacific uh, at uh, Natixis and an adjunct professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And for our viewers everywhere, it's been good to have your company. If you've enjoyed today's episode or have anything you would like to add to the dialogue, join the conversation on our social media. And remember, stay informed, stay engaged, and stay connected.